Jonathan, if you can turn off your video. And we are now live on Facebook, so I'm going to start the webinar to let people in and you're welcome to turn on your videos, but keep your mics uh, quiet except uh, when you're ready to uh, to speak. So I'm ready to start now. And welcome to those who are coming in. Uh, we're just waiting for the room to fill. We are uh, also uh, live casting on uh, Facebook and we all just get started in, uh, in a few minutes as we uh, have uh, everybody enter the room. And for those that are entering the uh, waiting room and those that are maybe already watching on live stream, we'll just be a moment or two more as uh, we get people on board and then we will get, get started. So we'll just give it another 30 seconds to a minute and be ready to start. And Dahlia, I think we can get started now. Uh, Jonathan, if you want to turn on your camera as well. Um, also known as Vancouver. And this webinar um, is sponsored by Just Peace Advocates and the Canadian BDS Coalition and the Canadian Palestinian Congress, Palestinian and Jewish Unity, and several others. Um, essentially, before we get into it, tonight's panel will be discussing various things such as shifts in Palestine organizing over the year, um, different uh, instances of, of Israel and we'll also be discussing um, the next steps forward um, as the year is ending. And essentially, um, we are also um, going to be discussing what, what we can learn from the past as well as the future in terms of Palestinian advocacy. Um, and recently there was the designation of the six Palestinian human rights organizations that were labeled as terrorist entities by Israel. So there are all applications for those designations that we will discuss in the US. Um, we'll also be opening up a Q&A section towards the end. So feel free to put any questions you may have for the panelists in the chat and we'll, we'll go through them towards the end. Um, and then, We'll also be discussing a really great legal and tactical guide that Just Peace Advocates initiated 
uh, which is essentially a guide that provides basic information on legal issues that Palestinian uh, organizers may face in Canada and tips on how to navigate them from legal experts and lawyers. And a lot of this information can be applicable to campus-specific uh, campus groups. So with that being said, um, our panelists today are Canadian lawyers, Shane Martinez, James Cassia, Andrea Sobko, and Jonathan Kutab, founder of al Haq Organization, also one of the recent six organizations Israel has designated as a terrorist entity. Um, also, honestly, the reason that this panel is also very important because in the past maybe two weeks or so, there has been tons of news in terms of Palestinian organizing happening in Canada. Uh, one example is last week, high school students in the Toronto District School Board, they walked out of their classrooms in support of Desmond Cole, a Black uh, journalist and activist, and a Toronto educator, Javier Davia. Um, and that was a very unprecedented instance of high school students standing in support of Palestinian organizers and just anyone who's supporting Palestine. Um, and another instance is illegal Israeli recruitment in Canada. So the IDF sends recruiters to different universities, specifically in Toronto, to recruit people, which is illegal, um, to recruit anyone for a foreign military in Canada. So these are just some snippets of what's happening um, in Canada and what these panelists will be touching on. Um, so going right into the program, our first speaker, Shane Martinez is a barrister and solicitor, criminal lawyer um, with a passion for social justice and human rights. Shane regularly writes and lectures about police brutality, racial profiling, the prison industrial complex, and transnational labor. Shane will be highlighting how law and campaigns come together in regard to advocacy work in support of justice for Palestine. This includes his recent filing of a CRA complaint regarding the Canadian Zionist Cultural Association. Um, so I'm going to pass it over to you, Shane. Wonderful. Thank you very much, Dahlia. Uh, and good evening, everybody. Uh, it's a privilege uh, to be speaking alongside such wonderful co-panelists uh, on this uh, on these very important and timely topics. Uh, my segment of tonight's presentation is going to be focused on legal advocacy related to grassroots campaigns in defense of uh, human rights in Palestine. Uh, now, condensing the law into a small portion of time can oftentimes be a challenge, but I'll do my best to cover uh, grassroots campaigns which have arisen uh, in the news over the last year and the legal work that has been done to support those campaigns. And I'm just going to take a moment now uh, to load up a PowerPoint presentation that you can follow along with. All right. Now, there's essentially three parts to what I'm going to be discussing tonight. Uh, first, we're going to look at obtaining the detailed information that you need to support your positions uh, in work that you're doing in the community. Second, we're going to look at speaking out on issues of concern. And through, uh, three, we're going to be looking at uh, translating words into action. So uh, freedom of information and, and getting the information that you need. Uh, in matters relating to Israel-Palestine, it is of really the utmost importance uh, that information being disseminated be accurate and verified. Uh, when matters involve any level of government, one way of confirming details around a particular event or an issue is to file a request for public records, often known as a freedom of information request. Now, such an approach is uh, just a practical tool, but I guess you could also frame it as indeed a responsibility. Um, anyone that's engaged in grassroots campaigns owes it to themselves, really, the public at large, to ensure they have correct and detailed particulars about the issues they are addressing. So typically there's three forums for freedom of information requests, three areas where you could make one. Um, so we can look at municipal, under the Municipal Freedom of Information and Protection of Privacy Act, uh, provincial under the Freedom of Information and Protection of Privacy Act, and also uh, federally under the Access to Information Act. Now, regardless of the level, uh, the intention of this legislation is to enhance the accountability and transparency of public institutions in order to promote an open and democratic society uh, and to enable public debate on the conduct of those institutions as well. Um, so this is supposed to be achieved by providing a right of access to information under the control of a government institution in accordance with really three uh, core principles that we're going to look at. Oh, I those. There we go. Um, 
So these core principles are that uh, first, government information should be available to the public. Uh, second, that the necessary exceptions to the right of access should be limited and specific. And uh, three, that decisions on the disclosure of government information should be reviewed independently of government. In other words, they cannot just deny you information and then make a decision when you challenge that, um, their denial. Um, it needs to go to an independent third party. There needs to be an independent appeal process. Now, over the last year, there's been a number of examples where freedom of information requests have played an important role in relation to advocacy around Israel and Palestine. Uh, one example is Israeli military recruitment in Canada. This has been an ongoing problem, uh, both from the Israeli consulate in Toronto and various groups aligned with it. And according to 2017 statistics from the IDF, two, 230 Canadians were serving in the Israeli military that year. Uh, this situation is particularly concerning given that it appears to violate various sections of the Foreign Enlistment Act, uh, which prohibits the recruitment of Canadians to serve in foreign armies. Uh, access to information requests filed with the Department of Justice and Global Affairs have sought to gain particulars about exactly what Canada has known about these recruitment efforts, and they also may shed light on whether Canadians in the IDF have been actively engaged in human rights abuses in the occupied Palestinian territories. Uh, another example involves some Canadian charities funneling money to Israel for the benefit of the Israeli military. Uh, earlier this year, Rabbi David Mivasser and Khalid Mumar filed a complaint with the Canada Revenue Agency about the activities of a group called the Canadian Zionist Cultural Association, also known as the CZCA, which is a registered charity. Uh, that complaint set out in significant detail allegations that the CZCA was funneling charitable donations in the millions of dollars to entities and programs in Israel, which directly or indirectly benefit the Israeli military. Now, accessing publicly available records, including annual auditors reports filed with the Canada, Canada Revenue Agency by the CZCA, opened a window into the organization's inner operations and revealed what appear to be other issues of concern that will be raised with the CRA uh, in a forthcoming addendum to the complaint. Uh, a third case that we can look at in regards to freedom of information pertains to the mislabeling of products imported to Canada from occupied territories in the West Bank. So if we look at uh, a complaint made by uh, David Kattenberg in 2017, uh, when he noticed that the LCBO was carrying wine with the label, uh, that, a label that said product of Israel. Now, Mr. Kattenberg was confident that uh, the wines had been imported from wineries located in settlements in the West Bank. Uh, now, despite his inquiries and calls for, for proper labor, labeling, the, Can the Can Canadian Food Inspection Agency remained inactive uh, and cited the Canada-Israel Free Trade Agreement as justification for uh, saying product of Israel. Now, by Mr. Kattenberg filing a Freedom of Information request, he discovered that the labels are not a trade issue over which the Canada-Israel Free Trade Agreement has any authority. So we can fast forward to May of this year, uh, the Federal Court of Appeal upheld a lower court decision that said that labeling wines produced in settlements in the West Bank as being products of Israel is misleading to consumers. And the Federal Court of Appeal confirmed that the matter would be sent back to the Canadian Food Inspection Agency to re-examine the rules of how such wines should be labeled. Uh, the case was an important development in, in really revealing aspects of Canada's problematic foreign policy uh, on Israel and Palestine. So now we can also look at um, freedom of expression, okay? Um, this was the second category um, that we had listed. Now, public speech about Palestine, as, as you know, it routinely draws attention. And throughout two, 2021, we've seen a number of examples uh, where this has occurred here in Ontario. So in April um, of this year, the Canadian Association of University Teachers uh, CAUT publicly announced its decision to censure the University of Toronto. Now, this move was taken after the CAUT determined that the university's administration had failed uh, to resolve concerns regarding academic freedoms uh, stemming from a hiring scandal in the Faculty of Law. Now, the censure was paused on September 17th of this year um, when evidence from a report into the allegations revealed that a donor to the university, who's also a, a federal court judge, objected to the hiring of Dr. Valentina Azarova based on her scholarly research on Israel's occupation of the Palestinian territories. Um, now this interference um, influenced the university's decision and caused it to rescind an employment offer 
um, that it, it had extended to her for the position of the director of the International Human Rights Program at uh, U of T, um, based on her, her expression and her, her speech regarding uh, issues pertaining to Palestine and Israel. Now, months of campaigning by academics across the world ended up causing U of T to finally re-offer the position to Dr. Azarova, um, but of course, for reasons which are quite understandable, um, that offer was not accepted uh, by her um, after everything that had happened. Now, uh, during, uh, if we want to look at another instance as well, uh, during a Toronto District School Board seminar on anti-Black racism this past uh, September, uh, Toronto author and independent journalist Desmond Cole spoke on broader themes of decolonization and used the words free Palestine. Um, that remark generated substantial consternation from some executive uh, members of TDSB who were in attendance. Um, we can also look at, uh, you know, if we're keeping with this theme of education, we can look at the case of uh, Javier de Vila, um, an educator with the uh, Toronto District uh, School Board. Now, in May of this year, he shared resources about the Israeli-Palestinian conflict and its history. Um, those materials uh, were derived from a variety of sources and included information distinguishing between anti-Semitism and critiques of Israel as a state. Um, some of the material also expressed criticisms about Canada's policies towards uh, Israel and Palestine. Uh, he ended up being suspended from his teaching position, but was reinstated in July of this year after widespread community support and an investigation into what occurred. Uh, now, free speech can be a very complex area of the law to navigate, um, and it can turn on a number of elements, including what's being said, um, how it's being said, and where it's being said. But ultimately, at the end of the day, Section 2B of the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms guarantees freedom of thought, belief, opinion, and expression. Um, and uh, there's a number of uh, values uh, and principles that inform that. Um, there's also uh, limitations on it as well that we're going to look at in a moment. Um, but uh, in essence, um, the, the Supreme Court of Canada has held that uh, freedom of expression plays an important role uh, in uh, seeking and attaining the truth, uh, that it fosters and encourages participation in social and political decision making, and that it helps to cultivate individual self-fulfillment uh, through expression as well. Now, we can move on to uh, freedom of assembly, and this is what we'll have just to, uh, to wrap things up. Um, with uh, this portion of the of tonight's presentation. So this takes us to our third and final topic. Uh, we know in 2021, there were historic mass mobilizations and campaigns in relation to Israel and Palestine. So in May of this year, we saw mass protests across the world where thousands of people took to the streets to express their opposition to the deaths of innocent people killed by Israeli security forces in Gaza and the West Bank. Uh, in Toronto, there were accounts of police operating surveillance drones over these demonstrations and deploying other mass surveillance methods as well uh, to monitor and, and record participants at them. Uh, that same month in May, uh, at a related demonstration outside the Israeli consulate, uh, Rabbi David Mivaser uh, was arrested in connection with the symbolic pouring of red paint over the steps leading up to the Israeli consulate. Uh, now, although the paint was reportedly uh, water soluble, um, Rabbi Mivaser um, was uh, charged um, with criminal code, with the criminal code offense of mischief and that matter remains uh, before the courts. And uh, finally, going back to the theme of education, as uh, was noted a bit earlier, um, uh, this month, 200 students at Mark Garneau Collegiate walked out of class to take, place, uh, take part in a free Palestine rally. Uh, those at the event also demanded that students and staff speaking out in favor of Palestinian human rights should not face uh, punitive consequences uh, within the school system. So we can look at, uh, Peaceful, you know, uh, the, the right to peaceful assembly in a bit more detail. Now, freedom of pe peaceful assembly, which includes the right to demonstrate and protest, is protected under Section 2C of the Charter. Uh, as uh, I noted earlier, the Charter applies to the state, right, which means that in this context, um, we're looking at peaceful assembly on pu uh, public property, so that can be sidewalks, public squares, government buildings, and so on. Uh, protesting on private property is something altogether different. Um, uh, and you know, although it, it can sometimes be possible for a period of time, it's often met with a request to leave under a threat of a trespass charge. Um, and differentiating between public and private spaces isn't always easy, um, which is why it's important to, to first do research uh, on the location where one might be attending, and sometimes even to consult a lawyer if it's necessary to determine what laws may or may not apply. Um, and as with uh, freedom of expression, section one of the charter allows the government to impose reasonable limits on peaceful assembly but only if those limits are ones which may be justified in a free and democratic society. 
Um, on occasion, people will encounter uh, police harassment at these kinds of events. Um, although time does to go into the applicable law in any kind of great detail, um, the Charter does provide uh, a number of protections that we can look at uh, right now. Um, so Section 8 of the Charter states that everyone has the right to be secure against unreasonable search or seizure. Uh, Section 9 guarantees that everyone has the right to not be arbitrarily detained or imprisoned. And in the event that someone is uh, detained or arrested at a, at a demonstration, Section 10 of the Charter requires the police to promptly inform that person of the reason. I'd also request the police to inform them that they have the right to retain and instruct counsel without delay and that they be allowed to do so uh, as well. All right. So having said all of that, um, this overview is really just scratching the surface of the legal issues arising out of grassroots, grassroots community work around Palestine. Uh, it's important to keep in mind that, that these topics, when we're talking about the law, often require more detailed discussion to, to properly understand them. Um, however, hopefully this has provided you with some initial reference points to consider in your own work. And I'm, I know that my fellow panelists are going to be expanding on a number of the topics that I've raised. Uh, and for those involved in activism and campaigning, uh, ultimately, at the end of the day, being aware of your rights and responsibilities under the law is, is useful in a variety of respects. It helps avoid unnecessary problems, contributes to the accuracy of information that's being disseminated to the public, and it ultimately uh, helps to build strong networks to inform and engage the public as well. So thank you very much for your attention. And with that, I will pass the mic over to James. Yeah, so our next speaker, James Kafia, who will be discussing challenges of academic freedom and advocacy in the age of the IHRA definition of anti-Semitism. James is a lawyer and the past president of the Canadian Arab Federation, vice president of the Palestinian Canadian Congress, who has provided leadership for many years related to Palestinian organizing. And in this context, he'll focus on civil liberties and human rights. Go ahead, James. Thank you very much. I've gone to share screen mode now, and I want to show uh, just a minute in the video. In fact, I'm just uh, while we're here, I'm going to put in the chat section uh, the link so that you have the link to the video I'm going to show you now. Uh, give me one moment, and I'll turn up the volume to make it uh, flow. And it'll. I'm just going to run it for a minute to give you the taste of it. This is a presentation by a student. Uh, in his high school classroom. And in fact, it was actually integrated into the school curriculum in 2014 in the province of Ontario. Another thing is that the answer and is used violence and- We'll start that again. I, I'm matched. And I'm going to talk about the Israel and Palestinian conflict that's been going on in the Middle East. So the conflict between Israel and Palestine has been going on for decades. And there is yet to be, and it has yet to be resolved, nor is there a resolution in sight. Over here, you can see uh, that little part uh, that is Israel next to Egypt. So, also, uh, you can see that this is a little spot here where the Gaza Strip is, and another spot here where the uh, West Bank is located. Well, the Palestinians are located in that Gaza Strip and the West Bank. The issue here is that the current occupation of the Palestinian land by the Zionists have violated the human rights of the Palestinians. They have deprived the Palestinians of natural resources, such as water, and taking the majority of it for themselves. The, the Zionists that are granted these privileges are backed by the military. Another thing is that the Israelis use violence and destructive tactics to continue their occupation. Okay. I'm going to just uh, stop that at this point. Uh, and uh, the, the interesting thing about that video is that it was part of a civics and careers course for grade 10. It was an e-learning course. And, uh, but there were parents who saw that after a number of years, really in 2020, and they brought this matter to the attention of the Minister of Education, Steve Lecce. And the ministry, well, they did, what they did is they ordered a probe into this material and they quickly labeled it anti-Semitic and they removed it from the curriculum. So you can see that again, there's uh, friends of Simon Wiesenthal Center for Holocaust 
studies shared an excerpt of the video and they had, were uh, critical of it. And you can see on the screen uh, some of what they had to say. I'm going to, um, going to move on here that it's important to note that the, students, the student was making um, a presentation that was less than three minutes long. It's about two minutes and 45 seconds. And he was talking about uh, what you heard. And in fact, uh, we've listened very carefully to his presentation and he deserves an award, frankly. We don't know who he is, except he goes by the name of Naj. And what's important is that his presentation was accurate in 2013 when he actually did it. Uh, there is uh, a hysteria uh, in, uh, in uh, our uh, political realm. We had a summit on anti-Semitism, for example, in, uh, in, in July. Uh, and uh, it was very much controlled and orchestrated. Uh, the Independent Jewish Voices Group, which does remarkable work, were blocked from any role uh, in the summit on anti-Semitism. And their opinion was that it was done essentially because the purpose of the summit was to uh, promote the International Holocaust and Remembrance Alliance's uh, definition, their working definition on anti-Semitism. And uh, it's, I'm, I'm gonna get into that now at this, uh, I'm gonna just change up. But uh, their, their contention is that uh, it is, uh, wrong uh, to to be sorry. Many of the substantial criticisms of Israel that you would hear are labeled as anti-Semitic, uh, and under the definition uh, of uh, the IRA definition on anti-Semitism, uh, you would you would understand that you're steered in that direction. I'm going to deal with it a little bit more, but this is some survey material uh, that was taken. Uh, by Canadians for Justice and Peace in the Middle East. It's an ECOS poll, but you can see that the uh, movements boycott divestment sanctions, uh, you know, claiming that Israel is unlawfully pushing Palestinians off their land. These are things that ordinary Canadians don't have any kind of an issue with. Uh, the, um, James, yes. sorry, I just want to cut in and say that we weren't able to see the video and we can't see your screen right now. Oh, okay. Um, I apologize for that. I'm not going to show the video anymore. Uh, I'm going to simply move on. Uh, are you seeing me? Yeah, we can see you. Okay, uh, you weren't able to see, were you able to hear the video a little bit? Yeah, yeah, the okay. audio is going through. I will, I will leave that then. Uh, and, but I am going to, let me, let me try again with other material here. One of the concerns we have is that there is a political movement to promote the IRA definition on anti-Semitism. And it's, uh, it's working through uh, the federal government, through political, the halls of power. Uh, they had a free vote, largely a free vote, and it passed. And it uh, has major issues in terms of stunting uh, academic freedom and free speech of ordinary Canadians by stigmatizing them for uh, wishing to speak on behalf or in, in support of Palestinian human rights. I'm going to move on to uh, another area here that I can show you because uh, there is um, a major issue here. Uh, in the wake of the Naj video, let's see if I can open this for us here. There were apologies from the York Region District School Board from uh, and this here, for example, is uh, an email that was sent out to parents from the Ottawa Carleton District School Board uh, back in September of 2020. Uh, and they're essentially you know, giving an apology for the video content having gone out to parents at that time. Uh, I'm going to uh, move on to another area here. This is, let's see. Are you able to see that? Okay, I see a nodding head. If you look in this corner here, this is the Toronto District School Board. The Toronto District School Board has its logo and uh, this is their website. And essentially we have the Simon Wiesenthal Center, uh, which has its uh, information 
being promoted through the Toronto District School Board. I'm going to move through these relatively quickly. Uh, we have, uh, if you click on anti-Semitism, there are a couple here that are important. It's anti-Semitism and anti-Semitism defined. So this is where you go if you click on that, it's anti-Semitism. And I have this in sections where they're basically talking about first thing, it's demonizing Israel. Okay, that's what this is about. They have racist tropes being presented. Israel's not an apartheid state. And we have on one hand, this presentation, uh, which should be read, but on the other hand, we have also the report of Human Rights Watch, uh, the world's largest human rights organization and Israel's uh, largest human rights organization, Beth uh, Salaam, telling us uh, that Israel is an apartheid state. We have Israeli Jews are not European colonial settlers. Well, that is uh, certainly something that runs counter to the to the the documented history. The, Israel is not committing ethnic cleansing. This is another one. Uh, words matter. The words from the river to the sea, Palestine. River. You're getting an idea of what the central uh, concerns that friends of Simon Wiesenthal have. Israel is not committing genocide. That, that and again, a, a message, a message against boycott, investment, and sanctions. And the words that Desmond Cole got in trouble with, uh, "Free Palestine" is a is a dog whistle for the destruction of Israel. This is how they promoted it. We have anti-Semitism defined. Again, there's the school board uh, logo, and you get into uh, they they do confirm that it's non-binding, non-legally binding, but they have their definition. And it's interesting that in eleven points that they present. There are seven references to Israel and Israelis in it. You can understand that the real purpose of this definition is to restrict criticism of Israel. It's not about anti-Semitism at all. But here it is in, uh, on the Toronto District School Board website. It's very difficult for a student like Naj or any high school student to present. We've heard examples uh, that were uh, referenced earlier uh, regarding Dr. Valentina Azarova, you know, a, a, a professor, uh, an academic with deep uh, grounding in human rights law, being subjected to uh, anti-Palestinian racism. She's not uh, Palestinian, but the subject matter had to be suppressed. And so it's very difficult. You can see the full spectrum from a, a, an advanced academic to some lad in a high school class having this difficulty in terms of presenting. And this is the material that's put in front of academics. It goes on below that, that they talk about conflating uh, anti-Zionism with anti-Semitism. That's what this whole section is about. And we come back and I'll, I'm going to, uh, give me one more moment here. We have, uh, a growing, I'm going to stop sharing here at this moment. Uh, I'm, I was part of a group that met with the Toronto District School Board on Monday, and they claimed that this material uh, that is offensive was removed, and yet I was able to screenshot it as recently as yesterday. So this relationship between the uh, school board, uh, between school boards, uh, if you go back to that apology from the Ottawa Carlton District School Board, the last paragraph promoted the IRA definition on anti-Semitism. There's a huge push for exactly that. And it's, uh, it creates a serious problem. Uh, it creates a serious problem for anyone who wants to speak about Palestinian human rights. There has to be an end to the partnership with pro-Israel advocacy, advocacy groups such as the Friends of Simon Wiesenthal Center or the uh, or, or, or CJA, uh, the Center for Israel and Jewish Affairs. The Friends of Simon Wiesenthal Center for Holocaust Studies uh, has, you know, has these tropes, these racist tropes on their website that they promote. We have uh, the, for CJA, we, you know, they were involved indirectly. David Spiro, the tax court judge who uh, intervened behind scenes to subvert a unanimous hiring decision, uh, is somebody with deep roots and uh, a long history with CJA. We have, uh, we often hear about how anti-Semitism is on the rise. 
I think the information is not very well documented. Anti-Semitism is a real problem, biggest problem. But a lot of it comes from B'nai B'rith's annual reports on anti-Semitism. There was a, a very good survey by Cheryl Nostel, uh, a critique of their 2019 survey, which indicated, if you look at their numbers, that those in Canada are 17 times more likely to experience anti-Semitism than Jews in the United States, where they have tiki torch marchers crying out, the Jews will not replace us. That's in the United States, but we're supposed to believe that in Canada, it's worse. Uh, there are things that they're, they're doing in the Toronto District School Board, for example, they're bringing in the National Council of Canadian Muslims to work alongside uh, CJA, for example, in promoting in developing material for the classroom on Israel-Palestine issues. The concern I have is this, uh, NCCM is an excellent organization, and if you were dealing with Islamophobia, it would be a perfect choice. But uh, it's important to understand that, uh, that the Israel-Palestine conflict is not about religion. This is not a Muslim Jewish problem. I'm, I'm Roman Catholic myself, but it doesn't matter what you are. This is a colonial settler movement that was displacing and is displacing the indigenous population. Uh, it's very important that we reject the IRA definition of anti-Semitism. This is a linchpin, it's critical. Uh, I mentioned that there were seven references to Israel and Israelis in it, in, in their 11 examples of anti-Semitism, but they also say that Israel is uh, you know, that saying that Israel is a racist endeavor is anti-Semitic. Well, the Palestinians on the ground would beg to differ. And it's important that people uh, have an opportunity to learn. And the school boards are essentially shutting that down. They're, the definition on anti-Semitism, Iris definition, uh, complains about applying a double, double standard by requiring uh, something of Israel that wouldn't be demanded of any other democratic nation. And the point is that many democratic nations can be accused of racism. What's actually being sought here is not equal treatment by Israel, but actually special treatment for Israel. I, I'm going to move on to the, the ultimate uh, point here for, uh, for schools and academics to be able to deal with the subject. In a democratic society, it's important that institutions of learning foster critical thought and uh, not censorship or indoctrination. So uh, we go back to Naj's uh, presentation. His presentation was actually about a, a speaker's corner. And it says in the introduction, introductory material for it that there's supposed to be room for everyone's opinion. Even sometimes uh, we encounter ones that we don't like. So this is an opportunity for a teaching moment for the, for the Minister of Education in Ontario. But instead, uh, he simply moved on to censor it because there were uh, political concerns raised very early on. We submitted a freedom of information request to find out what was informing the minister's office. We received some 300, over 350 documents toward that. And it's very clear that very early on, the material was labeled and the minister acted at the behest of very powerful concerns. It's important for schools uh, to allow the academic process to move forward. They have to respect the professionalism of their teaching staff and the intelligence of students to explore the subject areas and draw their own conclusions based on their findings. So for example, to allow the students maybe through online learning to click on a link, is Israel an apartheid state? And you can find out what Sija and the friends of Simon Wiesenthal think, or you could click on the other link to find out the other argument, and you might find the report of, of Human Rights Watch, so that students could make decisions for themselves by freely exploring the material. The final thing I wanna say, there was talk about um, the walkout at, by hundreds of students at Marc Garneau Collegiate. And that's very important that it's a telltale because as bad as things are right now, this is going to get worse. And this is the beginning of a very important phase in the Palestinian quest for human rights. There is a nexus between the experience of first uh, countries uh, and the Palestinian struggle for human and national rights. There is a clear connection, a colonial settler co uh, narrative 
connection. And this is causing a panic within, within the Zionist community. Uh, this, this, uh, pass the floor to you. If this, thank you. Thanks, James. Um, we'll be going on to our next panelist, um, Andrea Sopko, who is a lawyer and practices in the area of human rights, employment law, workplace investigations, and labor law. Andrea has extensive experience as a legal researcher in international criminal law and international human rights law. She has also designed resources on access to justice issues including the Tactical Guide, the Palestinian Human Rights Issues in Canada, um, which she will be touching base on. So passing it on to you, Andrea. Thanks, Dahlia. Uh, good evening, everybody. It's a pleasure to be with you all tonight. Um, so as Dahlia said, um, my presentation tonight is going to be focused on the Palestinian Human Rights Legal and Tactical Guide. So I'm just going to share my screen with you to get some slides up. Um, and Dahlia, I'll just um, ask you if you can um, give me a signal if this is looking okay. Yeah, looks okay. Great. We can see that. You can see that okay? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Um, okay, so uh, over the past uh, year, year and a half or so, um, I've had uh, the opportunity to work with um, Karen Rodman and Just Peace Advocates on um, a legal resource, which um, I think you have a link to in the chat, um, but uh, if not, hopefully uh, Dahlia or Karen can um, one. In. It's a free uh, resource that's available um, on the Just Peace Advocates website, um, the title of which is Palestinian Human Rights in Canada, Legal and Tactical Guide. Um, we did an original version that was published in September 2020 and then um, uh, did some updates to it and, um, and republished it in June um, and so the overall purpose of the guide is to provide legal, um, basic information on legal issues for Palestinian rights activists um, who uh, are sort of looking to find general information about um, legal issues, um, case studies, issues that they want to sort of build their own personal knowledge of, or if you're an organizer, a community activist, somebody who's doing education training with a group of people, you can find a lot of content in there as well. Um, and so sort of what I'm going to do tonight is um, try and connect some of the uh, content and resources to things that um, Shane and James were talking about to hopefully um, identify some ways that you can um, have some content and tools um, that you can use as a takeaway and, um, and hopefully we'll be able to uh, use these um, after in other contexts um, to connect with some of the um, topics that they were identifying. And then I'm also going to spend a little bit uh, more time in depth highlighting um, a couple of the cases that um, are more in the theme of the year in review. Um, so that's sort of the purpose of the guide. And then we also included um, just some uh, campus specific information. Um, and as we've talked about tonight, um, a lot of issues that have come up uh, around the, the education theme. So that's been really, really relevant over the last year. Um, the audience is uh, really broad. It's uh, for activists, organizers, lawyers, and really anybody who's interested in learning more about Palestinian human rights issues. Um, and we just wanted to um, mention that it's really just a legal information in the resource. It's not meant to be a substitute um, for any legal advice. Um, and so, uh, you know, if there's a specific issue, a legal issue that you are having, you should always obviously contact a lawyer. And that is something um, that uh, Just Peace Advocates can also assist with. And there's information in the guide about um, how to contact about that. Um, so in terms of 
Oh, uh, I'm not obviously going to have time tonight to get into all of the topics and and um, cover each individual one, but I just wanted to give you an overall um, review of the contents of what you can expect to find in it. So there are some general tips on um, activism. Um, I'm going to briefly talk about uh, the free speech rights section just to connect to what Shane was talking about. There's a section on solidarity actions, the right to protest and criminal issues that you might face. Um, I'm going to get into a little bit more detail about um, potential lawsuits by or against you, including slap litigation, the campus specific issues, um, surveillance and law enforcement. And this section um, touches a little bit on um, also something uh, around the issues that Shane was talking about in terms of search and seizure issues in section eight of the charter. Um, and then there's a section on um, boycott, divestment and sanctions. And then um, there's a really detailed long list of additional resources um, that you can go to and uh, a list of referrals. Um, okay, so just uh, as a as a really quick sort of um, link to some of the things that we've already heard in tonight's great presentations. Um, so the very first section, um, and if you are looking at a link to the guide right now, you can find it at pages two to five, um, are the in the free speech rights section. Um, it is, uh, there is a very detailed overview of section um, 2B of the charter talking about um, free speech um, under, under the charter, including um, how it's broadly defined by the Supreme Court of Canada, um, what uh, the sort of principle of content neutrality is, um, and then also talking about the limits under section one of the charter. This section also um, goes into um, uh, hate speech and hate propaganda under the Criminal Code of Canada, and then it also talks about um, various uh, human rights laws and um, in the provincial, uh, provincial and, and territorial human rights laws. But some of the key takeaways in this section are just around um, issues about um, criticism of Israel being um, constitutionally protected speech. Um, and the fact that expression um, critical of Israeli policies is neither hate propaganda or hate speech under the Criminal Code of Canada. Um, and it sort of goes into a lot more detail and gives some case studies on that. Um, and then it talks about how to distinguish that from expression um, that uh, sort of condemns Israel as an apartheid state, which is um, not anti-Semitic versus criticism of the Jewish people as a whole, um, which can be considered anti-Semitic. Um, so those are some of the things that you can find in that section. And I just wanted to kind of flag that for you because it linked a lot to um, some of the concepts that uh, Shane was talking about and just some of the things more broadly that we've been seeing a lot of the um, expression cases that have been coming up over the last year. Uh, and again, this is another one, just I'm not going to go into a lot of detail, but I wanted to flag that it's in the guide because there's a really um, common thing that we hear of or that people um, who are doing a lot of activist and organizing work are always sort of looking for information on. So in the second section on solidarity actions, the right to protest and criminal issues, there is a really great sort of major on do's and don'ts about um, demonstrations and sort of what to bring to demonstrations or protests and what not to. Um, so that's in there and something to look out for. And then there's a really good overview on um, rights with the police, including um, if you can record the police, um, what to look out for if you're doing that, if you have to provide identification um, rights in terms of searches, um, uh, issues around detention and arrest, including your right to counsel and your right to remain silent under the charter. Um, and then it goes through a list of some of the common charges that might come up. Uh, like criminal charges um, in the protest context. So um, those are some things that you can find in the guide.
Um, okay, and then one of the things I wanted to go into a little bit more detail in detail tonight um, is a case that um, is a is a 2021 case um, in the civil context. So there is um, a section on civil lawsuits. So it's the one that's called potential lawsuits by or against you. Um, you can find it at pages uh, 14 to 18 of the resource. And um, something that uh, you, a, a type of lawsuit you may have heard of, uh, the acronym is SLAP. Um, it stands for Strategic Lawsuits Against Public Participation. Um, and so what those are, are basically lawsuits that are often brought um, without any sort of um, real merit to them um, and often are with the objective of sort of intimidating um, or silencing the individual or organization. Um, uh, and, and they often, um, that, that organization that, are, that they're meant to be silencing often has significant, significantly less financial means than um, those who are actually bringing the lawsuit. Um, they typically do arise in the context of a defamation lawsuit, but there are other um, very limited contexts where, um, where slaps can also arise and, and examples of those could be a breach of contract lawsuit or a breach of confidentiality cases case but you um, most often see them in defamation cases um, in 2015 Ontario enacted um, a piece of legislation called the protection of public participation act and as part of that um, it introduced a uh, two sections into the Court, Courts of Justice Act, um, sections 137.1 to 137.5. Um, and basically what that did is it provided um, this sort of uh, expedited summary mechanism um, for, de uh, for defendants of um, these slap lawsuits to have these actions dismissed. So it was a faster, um, and less expensive way if someone had brought a defamation suit to have them dismissed. Um, and Quebec actually was the first province in Canada to introduce that type of legislation. Um, and then Ontario followed and then British Columbia modeled its legislation after the Ontario um, anti-slap legislation. So there's now three provinces that have it. Um, and that little green box there has the, the pieces of legislation. So I wanted to tell you about um, an Ontario Court of Appeal decision that came out last year. Um, it involved the Canadian Union of Postal Workers, or CUPW, um, and B'nai B'rith. And so the facts around the case were basically that, um, uh, so Cup W um, regularly uh, participates, uh, they do like joint projects with um, other, other postal unions in other jurisdictions. And so they had this capacity building project with the Palestinian Postal Service Workers Union. Um, and they also have made like, a public statement supporting the BDS movement and a boycott of Israeli products. Um, and so in and around uh, 2018, there was a worker um, a, and a, a Jewish Cup W member had brought a complaint to B'nai B'rith about the union's um, uh, joint uh, capacity building project um, and their support of the BDS movement. And so when B'nai B'rith started looking into um, Cup W's 2018 sort of activities around that time, they found out more about this association with PPSWU, um, including they found this Facebook page that was maintained by a senior member of the Palestinian Union. And it included um, messages in Arabic that was um, praising individuals that were involved in, um, in terrorist activity against Israel. And they also found postings that um, B'nai B'rith had 
in their view, interpreted as calling for the destruction of Israel. So based on that, um, B'nai B'rith sent, um, they sent those findings to Cup W and asked for comment on it, gave them one day to comment on it and said, um, we're going to publish a story about this and your association with this Palestinian Union. And then five days later issued a press release saying the Canadian postal workers align with pro-terrorism -ter Palestinian Union. Um, and then that, and the, uh, the uh, press release made statements about um, the union glorifying terrorists, said that rather than using the union movement to build peace between Israel and Palestinians, that Cup W leadership has aligned itself with the path of violence and extremism. And then they also took issue with the fact that Cup W was compelling Jewish and Israeli members to pay um, union dues towards what it deemed as supporting a foreign organization that wants to see them murdered. Um, so the legal claims around this were that Cup W sued B'nai B'rith for defamation over these um, press releases, basically stating that um, the issue was that it was defamation because they were saying that they supported terrorism and also calling them anti-Semitic. And they also said that they acted maliciously. So then in response, Brene Brith filed a statement of defense, but then they also used this anti-SLAP legislation to have the defamation action um, dismissed. And so it went all the way up to the Court of Appeal. And the Court of Appeal in a unanimous decision that was just released in July um, dismissed B'nai B'rith's appeal um, and it upheld the original decision of the motion judge um, and ultimately allow, which will ultimately allow Cup W's defamation lawsuit to move forward. Um, and Interestingly, they also said that Cup W is entitled to sue the individuals, the individual employees that actually wrote the press releases, because they said that um, they had direct involvement in the authorship and publication of the def uh, defamatory statements. Um, and they, the motion, the court held that the motion judge did not make a reviewable error when he found that Cup W had a solid case for defamation um, because the press releases actually referred to the union by name. And it also found that there were serious flaws in the defenses that B'nai B'rith raised and that they were not certain to be successful. Um, and and then the other significant finding was that um, B'nai B'rith's speech had not been chilled, which was one of the arguments they made, because um, they did not actually remove the press releases from their website until after they were sued. And then um, also one of the authors wrote an article about Cup W after their, the notice of libel was served. Um, so it's an interesting case about um, how those anti-slap uh, legislation is used because you actually often, it, the intended purpose of it was, is actually to be used by the other side. And so, um, so this is, I think, um, I, I, important in that it was it was not being allowed to be used in a way that um, the legislation was not actually intended to be used. Um, and then the chilling effect piece uh, relates to a lot of what we were talking about in terms of free speech as well. Um, Okay, I'm, I'm just mindful of the time, so I'll, I'll go through this pretty quickly, but I know we've talked a lot about um, the issue around the IHRP program, but I just wanted to flag that in the campus specific issues um, section that we do have a really um, detailed overview of that, um, that case. And so um, I know Shane and James both mentioned um, the issue of 
Valentina Azarova and the directorship. So um, I just wanted to uh, sort of highlight obviously some of the key um, events that happened were around, you know, starting around April 2020 when the job posting first went out. Um, and uh, in and around September 4th, when um, Justice David Spiro first raised the concerns um, about, you know, potential reputational harm to the University of Toronto and wanted to sure, ensure that the university did its due diligence. That was also when um, former Dean um, of U of T, uh, Edward Yakabuchi was uh, first initially briefed. Um, uh, in and around September 6th, um, that's when the Dean uh, who was previously not involved at all in the hiring process, um, started sort of getting involved and, and started referring to um, the donors' concerns as a complicating factor. And when asked, um, when the Dean notified uh, Professor Audrey Macklin, who was the chair of the selection committee, um, and was asked if it was actually because of Azarova's work on Israel and Palestine, he said it is an issue, but given the other immigration and work permit issues, he didn't need to turn to that. Um, and so uh, the immediate fallout, as has already been mentioned, was significant because the entire selection committee resigned. One of the paid members of the IHRP resigned. Um, their entire advisory board it resigned. There were over 1,400 lawyers and academics that um, signed on to open letters. This was just in the absolute immediate aftermath in the fall of 2020. Um, uh, former Supreme Court of Canada Justice Thomas Cromwell then um, drafted a report that was widely criticized for failing to make findings on credibility or addressing any um, issues of academic freedom. It ultimately exonerated U of T and the former Dean and um, concluded that there was no offer or acceptance in the strict legal sense that occurred between Azarova and the university, um, and that they were just at a, advanced stages in the negotiations. This all led to what we've already discussed was the CAUT censure, um, which uh, was enacted as of April 22nd, 2021, in a vote of 79 to 0 of their delegates, um, and on a finding that um, it violated the principles of academic freedom, collegial governance, and institutional autonomy. Um, it also had extreme consequences for the university because there were mass resignations and cancellations coming from all over the world. Um, and then as of September 17th, um, the censure has been put on hold because uh, the university has now met one of CAUT's key demands, which was to re-offer Azarova, the IHRP, director position, um, which they reposted just last summer, but she declined. And this was her statement, um, declining. Um, and one of the things that's interesting is she said that um, in her statement, partly she says that she realized that, um, that her leadership of the program would remain subject to attack by those who habitually conflate legal analysis of the Israeli-Palestinian context with hostile partisan partisanship. Um, so she ultimately declines. And then in and amongst all of this, there's the Canadian Judicial Council complaint against David Spiro, um, which was initiated in June 2021. Um, and in May 20, on May 21st, um, they conclude that even though he makes a quote, serious mistake, that it was not serious enough to warrant his removal from office or a full inquiry. That is now on judicial review to the federal court. And 
it has now come to light that the tax court also had a policy in place in and amongst all of those investigations that they were screening counsel and litigants to prevent Muslims from being involved in cases before him during that entire time, which they also, of course, kept secret. Um, so that in and of itself is an entire session. Um, but there is a good summary in there. Um, and the last thing I'm going to flag is just that we have information on how to make freedom of information requests um, in the guide as well. And there is a great detailed section on boycott, divestment, and sanctions. And I will stop there because I think I'm way over my time. <laughs> Thanks, Andrea. Um, so we'll be going on to our last panelist um, for the night, which is Jonathan Kutsab. Jonathan co-founded Al-Haq in 1979, um, which is one of the six organizations, again, that Israel has designated recently as a terrorist entity. Um, Jonathan is currently the executive director of Friends of Sabil in North America and the founder of Just Peace Advocates and on the board. Jonathan will be speaking about the current situation as it relates to the designation of these organizations and what is required next from the international community. Thank you. I, I want to thank uh, the wonderful uh, panelists for very, very uh, thoughtful uh, presentations that they made. I also want to thank the audience for sitting through one hour of legalese. We lawyers uh, sometimes, uh, while being very uh, specific in our presentations, uh, do not always manage to capture the attention of a lay audience. So I want to appreciate the audience. And I'm sure many of you will be uh, downloading this recording to listen to it at leisure later on, particularly the uh, handbook that was prepared by just peace advocate because it is important. We really need to know the law and the president precedents, and we really know need to know how to maneuver uh, through this uh, difficult uh, legal uh, situation. I want to talk about something a little bit different. I want to talk about the situation back in Palestine today, in the context of international law, because it does relate to all these issues that you are struggling with right now. And then you must understand that international law is a living organism. It is continuously evolving. A large part of it depends on basic acceptance by the community of nations and by the international community. So there will always be those who will violate international law but then they will be censured. They, they will be sanctioned. They will be put up to ridicule. They will be urged either by other countries or when other countries fail to do so by decent people, civil society, by universities, by students, by churches, uh, by mosques, by unions, uh, by just ordinary people who care about what's right and what's wrong. Having said that, I wanna point out that the State of Israel and the Zionist movement seems to have reached a very interesting point in its history, short history, I might say. It's only been about a hundred years for the Zionist movement really, and only about 70 years for the State of Israel. But during that time, the Zionist movement feels that it has won. It has gotten everything it wanted. It has complete control of the entire land of historic Palestine. It has created a powerful mini superpower. It has managed to kick out two thirds, literally ethnically cleansed two thirds of the population of Palestine. And the remaining third, it has managed to fragment them into five different, four different categories, 
each with its own rules, its own limitations, its own restrictions, both as to travel, residency, and level of autonomous control, uh, and the severity of the oppression that it, it faces. Whether it's Gaza, you know, a major open air prison, or whether it's uh, the West Bank being cut into A, B, and C, and their own population, their own leadership supposedly serving the interests of the occupation. Whether it's in East Jerusalem where people are residents but not citizens and constantly fearful of losing their status, or whether it's so-called Israeli Arabs, Palestinians who are citizens of Israel, who are basically uh, kept out of political life and effective political participation in Israel's uh, events. So Israel feels we've won. We've gotten everything we want. No combination, not, certainly not the Palestinians, but no combination of Arab or Muslim armies offers any really serious threat to us. The international community is, 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 is really shackled uh, because the United Nations can only operate through the Security Council where the five uh, permanent members have veto power. So that even if we act totally against international law, we can always count on our friends to veto any actual sanctions against us. So at some critical point, I'm not sure when, probably during the last five years or so, the Zionist movement decided it no longer needed to seek the sympathy or support of the international community that all it needs is to actually exercise power over the 1% or get into alliances with the 1% who are in power so that they can do whatever they want. In other words, I am noticing, and I am, I've been involved in this for many, many years. I've been noticing that in recent years, Israelis, and their apologists and supporters are no longer interested in winning arguments. They're interested in silencing debate, in having no discussion take place on the merits. So yes, of course, they will say this is not apartheid, but they really don't care. If they can manage to keep that crime of apartheid, and it is a crime, out of the international criminal courts. If they can use their power to suppress any kind of expression of support for the Palestinian people. Now, I think Israel realized very quickly that the only people who really are still resisting in any effective way are the international civil society through the BDS movement which is a nonviolent movement. It's boycotts, divestments, and calling for sanctions. And so they have exerted a lot of effort to demonize BDS, to make the words BDS the equivalent of uh, a, a dangerous thing that you don't want to touch, you don't want to be anywhere near, that you don't want to have anything to do with. In fact, they are working to criminalize BDS. Already in the United States, there are about 26 states that have passed legislation which they knew to be unconstitutional, making BDS illegal and, and, and requiring anybody who does any business with these states to sign uh, declarations that they will not boycott Israel or the Israeli settlements, even though that is like the fundamentally basic right of First Amendment, what you would call charter rights in Canada. And they know that these laws are unconstitutional, but they pass them because of the effect it has. 
the chilling effect. It prevents people from speaking their mind when it comes to Palestine and Palestinians. The second thing they did was through the power of definition. They say we are powerful and we have, I don't use the word control, but we have tremendous influence over those who are in centers of power in many countries. So we will create a new definition, the IHRA definition of what anti-Semitism is, which means that we can blame, we can utilize all the sentiment as well as the laws which prohibit hate speech and which prohibit racism and which prohibits anti-Semitism, we can utilize all these measures against anybody who criticizes the state of Israel or the Zionist movement and make their life miserable, make them lose their jobs, their careers, their standing in the community, their reputation, make them spend all their life just trying to fend off this accusation, which we don't have to prove. All we have to prove is that they fit within a definition which we have passed and created uh, sort of under the radar. We've managed to get many universities and colleges to sort of sign off on it. And pretty soon it will be in the student handbook and pretty soon it will be in the uh, local uh, provi uh, provincial uh, legislation. And then when somebody is, is, is accused of anti-Semitism, look, I'm not just accusing him. Here's a definition and his behavior fits that definition. This has also been carried out to Palestine. How? By defining civil society itself as terrorist organizations. This uh, recent action against six organizations, including Al-Haq, is not a whim by one particular person. It is a strategic step that was hatched we are told now, that was hatched in the Ministry of Strategic Affairs. Ministry of Strategic Affairs is a special department, mostly secretive, that was created at the ministerial level with a budget that is secret, nobody knows how much it is, specifically with the task of fighting those who are delegitimizing Israel and its behavior locally and abroad. And they proudly say, we are behind all this anti-BDS legislation that you see all over the world. We actually funded the passing of legislation that included the IHRA definition of anti-Semitism. We actually created and paid money out of the state budget of the state of Israel to get these things to occur in Canada and the United States and other countries. So that if we have power and if we can exercise the power of definition, we will be able to tell everybody who is a terrorist and who isn't, what constitutes anti-Semitism and what doesn't. What constitutes peace and a peace process and peaceful negotiations and what, cons uh, what constitutes violence? Even if it's not violent like BDS, it'll be considered economic terrorism, diplomatic terrorism, legal terrorism, any attempt to bring them to task for what they're doing is defined as uh, terrorism. Now, what do you do about that? How do you deal with that? I can say that in Canada, as a member of the community of nations, you have to be aware of the dynamics of what is taking place. And the case that you heard about the professor who was denied tenure is a perfect case in point. Because the 1% acting through a judge who is a donor contacts the university 
who contact the dean, who is not part of the decision-making process of selecting this person, and tells them that there are reputational consequences to you if you hire this particular professor. And so she was disinvited and the offer to her was removed. Now, in that case, there was such an outcry. The committee itself resigned. Many of the faculty resigned. Many of the other universities also uh, moved to censure uh, the university for basically uh, trying to whitewash and cover up uh, what was really an act of silencing Palestinian advocacy. Why do I end up with this story? I end up with this story to say that it is not a hopeless case. That for all their power, for all their connections, for all the money that they can pour into this exercise, for all the lawyers that are willing to harass and make your life miserable, if you at all show any kind of support for the Palestinian cause, for all this power that they amass at the level of the 1%, at the level of society itself, they are losing. And they are not only losing with the average Canadians only, they are particularly losing with the Jewish community in Canada and in the United States, particularly among the young. And that must be stated and must be stated clearly that for Jewish North Americans today, the issue is really ethical and moral. They can no longer support policies which they know to be oppressive, which they recognize from their own experience to be racist, discriminatory, and apartheid. And this is especially among the young. And the crisis is there and the crisis is deep. And the role of civil society, in my view, is to stand up for international law, to stand up for principles which we are willing to apply across the board to friend and foe alike. This is the essence of how international law operates and how genuine activism operates and how in the end, even the most oppressive regimes are forced to come to terms with the demands of justice. Now, the state of Israel is not capable, period, is not capable of living in the world of the 21st century today without massive support from the outside, without massive support from Europe, and North America, support that is both financial, technological, institutional, cultural, educational, military, and diplomatic. And this is where I think our battle lies. If we can bring the issue back to questions of morality, ethics, and justice because that's the only thing we Palestinians have going for us anymore. Thank you. Awesome, thank you, Jonathan. Um, so we're gonna be moving on to the question and answer portion of the panel. And there are some great questions that we can touch on. Uh, so the first, question that we can, um, any of the panelists can answer is, uh, what advice do you have for law students and early career lawyers who are afraid of losing job offers or being bullied in the workplace for speaking out on Palestine? Do they have any recourse and how do we hold law firms accountable for this? Yeah, so anyone feel free to jump in. I think Shane or Andrea should. Sure. Uh, I'm happy to comment on that. Uh, it, it is uh, an issue that, that certainly comes up. Uh, 
I, I've heard it a number of times over the years of, of people like expressing particular views in private, but then not wanting to adopt them in public. Uh, I, I think ultimately it comes down to being uh, an ethical and principled decision on behalf of, of any lawyer. Um, they have to decide um, uh, if they're witnessing something that is wrong and something that requires advocacy, uh, and if they have the ability to speak out on it and engage with it as a legal issue, um, then they have to make a, a, a choice whether or not they're going to do that. Um, it's up to each person to make that decision. And uh, I understand that some people may uh, feel as though they're pulled in different ways because of uh, how it may impact them in, in their professional life, especially students that are, that are younger and that are just going into the, into the field. Um, I know that they can certainly be uh, intimidating to think, well, how, how might my firm or my employer view me um, if I, if I uh, speak out about Palestinian human rights? Um, but I think it's, it's something that uh, after contemplating it carefully and uh, thinking about the need to, to raise awareness and, and to advocate on behalf of um, what is unquestionably one of the most serious humanitarian issues um, of our time, I think the decision is quite easy uh, with respect to what needs to be done. Awesome. Thank you. Um, there's, this, I think, a comment slash question uh, that I think is important to touch on. So one of the questions, well, one of the comments starts off saying that they have a seven lesson curriculum for senior high school students, including an excellent simulation game posted on the CG, CJPHL website. Um, and then the question is, I'm wondering if we should perhaps be posting some kind of information or suggestions about how teachers can avoid pushback speaking on Palestine. If so, what would you suggest we say? Um, so I'm gonna just jump in and say that there's actually a really good resource online that you can find and it's called Teaching Palestine. And it's an educational resource guide that puts resources and articles on essentially just how to talk and teach about Palestine. So that would be a good resource to include on a website um, and also essentially incorporate Palestinian history the same the same way you would as any other uh, any other global issue. So um, I think I don't think that question needs anything beyond that. Um, so another question for panelists, and then we'll do maybe two more. Um, so this question says, if taxpayers are an, inadvertently supporting its implementation of the IRA definition through a program of anti-racism of the government of Canada who has adopted the IRA, is there any way to sue the government over violation of free speech? Does anyone want to take that or do you want to move on again, to another question? Again, you need a Canadian lawyer. Andrea, you want to give it a shot? I think one of the challenges that you have is that it's being done as something that's non-binding. But uh, in fact, when, when I met with the Ottawa Carleton District School Board, they were very quick to point out, Government of Canada has adopted it. The province of Ontario has adopted the IRA definition. And so it has a great deal of moral suasion. And if you're defined as uh, Jonathan said, if you're defined as a racist uh, in the examples that are presented, it's very difficult to have any any footing to speak. What um, and I'll point back to the survey work that was done by uh, Canadians for Justice and Peace in the Middle East. You can see that ordinary Canadians are way ahead of the government of Canada. It's only because. Last year. this. The NDP policies, the NDP is being dragged by the membership. 80% uh, supported a resolution that uh, spoke in terms of def defending Palestinian human and national rights, at least to end trade with, uh, with of military weapons to Israel and trade with settlements. But the elite within the party had to be dragged along to have that happen. So it's going to require 
something of an uprising by ordinary Canadians against the political elite. But until you break that, it's not going to happen. They're very clever in its use uh, and very effective. Uh, but this is really just starting. You, you saw the walkout again at uh, Marc Garneau Collegiate. Uh, you're, you're seeing fragmentation in their power that Jonathan referred to, real limitations that they have. They've been trying to shut down BDS, and at the same time, it continues to grow. And, uh, and I think ultimately, uh, there will be a rude awakening down the road when they find out that all the money they poured into to targeting these, uh, these institutions, these movements, have amounted to nothing. They're not getting value for their money. Thank you. Um, we'll let's take two more questions. Uh, another question here says, can Canadians be charged for expressing support for BDS and its goals, uh, considering the prime minister condemned it a while ago? Well, I can tell you in Israel, you can. Because if you express, if you give any kind of material support for a terrorist organization, including al haq uh, or if you make any public expression of support for that organization, then you are guilty of a criminal offense and you can be tried before Israeli courts. Uh, they've tried with BDS to basically turn people back at the airport uh, or uh, deport people who are there on a tourist visa if they express any support for uh, BDS. And BDS was still not declared a terrorist organization. Uh, so here with, with, with this declaration, uh, I think they have greater power. And if there was no pushback, I would not be surprised if they will pressure the Canadian government to also declare these six organizations, terrorist organization in Canada. And if that happens, yes, the answer is you will be criminally prosecuted under the anti-terrorism acts uh, for any support, uh, donations, or any public uh, expression of uh, support uh, for, or encouragement for a terrorist organization. Already they're trying to do that with Samidun, uh, uh, one uh, organization that they claim is affiliated with the PFLP. Uh, so uh, you, you must remember also that not only PFLP, but Fatah itself, as well as Hamas, as well as the PLO, are still on the books in Israel as terrorist organizations. And when people from these organizations try to travel to the US or to Canada, they have to get a special waiver because they are still on the books as terrorist organization. The, the power of definition is, is, is really tremendous. Just to follow up on, on what Jonathan said, just for a moment, um, in Canada right now, um, there's nothing, uh, there's no law that would make it illegal to, to express support for BDS or to be actively involved in BDS. But what Jonathan's saying is very much correct, that we need to remain vil uh, vigilant, uh, both as lawyers, but also community members at large, about pressure that's being put on the federal government in Canada in terms of classifying different organizations. And what we've seen in Israel with organizations like al Haq. And, and, and what it's going through right now, I think we need to make sure that we have our finger on the pulse of what's happening right here. And we need to follow the lead of the international community in condemning uh, classifications of, group, of groups like al Haq as terrorist organizations and ensure that the Canadian government doesn't follow suit because there is undoubtedly pressure behind the scenes um, to, to do that here as well. It has not happened yet, um, but that's not to say that it's outside the realm of possibilities. Um, and so this will be the, one of the final questions, but just going off on what Jonathan, you were saying about Samadun, this question actually relates to this. Um, so in February of 2021, uh, Israel also designated Samadun as an affiliate of the PFLP and as a terrorist entity. So one of, the, one of, the, one of these questions actually asks, are supporters in Canada of Palestinian organizations declared as terrorist entities by Israel are they liable to be prosecuted as supporting terrorist organizations? And how can we prevent that? Because um, a lot of the organizations actually in the US and Canada are working with these groups, especially for Samadun, who does a lot of work in the diaspora. 
So um, how essentially, the, yeah, the question is asking, how can we prevent that? And are they liable to be prosecuted? Yeah, uh, again, uh, so far, not yet, but it could be very close. You must understand that all Palestinian organizations, by, by definition, are illegal in Israel and under the Israeli occupation. Uh, not, not just the, and, and, and the organizations that actually practice armed struggle, which these uh, civil society organizations don't. But even the ones that practice armed struggle are throughout Palestinian society. And that is a legitimate international uh, behavior. Uh, and separate from terrorism. But the definition, the part of definition, anybody who's involved in armed struggle is considered terrorist. That terrorist organization, even if it carries out purely civilian functions, they're considered terrorism. If they have health committees that are associated somehow with them, the health committees are supposed to be terroristic. If they do human rights work, that is also terrorism. Uh, if they teach Debke and dancing, that is terrorism. And then these organizations, which have also been declared terrorists, become also uh, the nexus uh, for anybody who associates with them also gets uh, targeted as well. Okay, so that is the end of the question portion. If anyone has other questions, please feel free to reach out to any of the panelists, um, myself and Just Peace. And uh, with that being said, again, thank you everyone for joining us tonight and for staying uh, for over an hour um, and asking great questions. And thank you panelists for this really important information. Um, again, I think Karen will be putting the links in the chat for those who wanna stay updated. And you will be receiving also, I believe, uh, this recorded panel. Um, and yeah, thank you everyone again. And we'll be closing off here. Bye.